sometimes you do have to say, look, this is not the right time in your life to do this because this type of dentistry is better not to do until you can really do it well. And right at the moment, I'm going to make too many compromises. It would be better for you to spend nothing than to do a half a job. So let's keep you stable. We'll keep your maintenance cycle. We'll maintain your teeth as best we can, make sure you don't lose any more. Uh, but this is not the best time for you to do it because we have to make so many compromises. You probably won't be happy and you'll have still spent most of your money. Patrus Sarati, I want you to think of a dentist who has inspired you a lot. Think of a dentist who has taught you so many clinical and non-clinical gems. Think of a dentist who you really admire because they are just brilliant at everything they do. And you just love interacting with their with their sort of um, content, whether they put content out there or, or any sort of messages that they send you, any mentorship they give you. And you're just in awe of that dentist. For me, that dentist is Dr. Lincoln Harris, who I'm so, so, so happy to be sharing this episode with you guys. He has been such a huge influence in my career, in my career t- trajectory. He's one of the dentists. He's probably the main dentist alongside with great dentists like Chris or Tidu Manku and whatnot, who have really pushed me to general dentistry. I would say Lincoln Harris is what we call a super GP, a super general practitioner, super GDP. Uh, he is just someone who I look at his cases and I look at his content and I think, what? why are you so annoyingly amazing at everything? But he made me realize that as a GDP, you can strive to that level. As a GDP, you can do complex dentistry. As a GDP, you can make your career extremely rewarding. So Lincoln, thank you so much for inspiring me so much. And I'm so pumped that you came on the podcast. Uh, I'm, I met Lincoln Harris uh, in Singapore uh, in 2016. Uh, he did the RATP course, which is Rapid Efficient Treatment Planning. And then I saw him in 20. 17 in Sydney, uh, al- alongside Pasquale Venuti on posterior quadrant dentistry. And gosh, I've been following this guy on social media because because essentially, if you don't know about Lincoln Harris, there used to be a group, there still is a group, uh, St- Style Italiano. Now, recently, I, I found out from an, an old Italian nurse of mine that it's actually not Style Italiano, it's Stil Stil Italiano. So from Stil Italiano, we see this beautiful before and after. This is around about 2013, 2014. Like everyone would just post these stunning before and after photos, right? And it was great. Like, you know, someone would post stuff before and after and you get like a, a thousand likes and people would be just like, oh my God, that's so beautiful. And we'd all admire dentistry from all over the world. And it was great. But then Lincoln came along and said, you know what? We can do it differently. Now, with no disrespect to Steel Italiano, these guys are great. Some of their blog posts are online are just so educational, so brilliant. But what Lincoln did is he, he evolved that group into his own group, which was Restorative Implant Practice Excellence. So we call it RIPE. And now it's part of RIPE Global. The purpose of this group was that when you're posting your dentistry, he wants you to post full protocol. Okay, every single photo, before, during, after, all those messy, bloody bits in between. And wow, like I think so many of us have learned so much from Facebook dentistry. For real. I mean, I know we can learn dentistry of YouTube, however scary that may sound to some patients, but it's true. We learn from videos, we learn from photos, we learn from descriptions. So all these dentists all over the world, through the platform that Lincoln founded, Ripe, um, it's just amazing what you can learn on Ripe. So I've been, I post about four or five cases on Ripe and I get messages from uh, you know, dentists all over the world sometimes saying, hey, that case you did, can I ask you about that? So, I mean, Lincoln's started this amazing community. So let's speak to Lincoln today and the topic I picked, because what topic do you pick for someone who is just so talented in almost every single domain? You feel as though he, he you know, I could do one on implants, ortho, anything with him, right? He's like I said, he's He's a super GP. So the topic I picked with him is the five lessons that he's taught me. Okay, the five key lessons that he's taught me that I'm so, so keen to share with you all. So join us with five lessons with Lincoln. Before we get to that, I'm going to give you the protrusive dental pearl. And again, this is a lesson that Lincoln gave me. Uh, so I'm going to share this with you all now. I can't really remember because now we actually recorded a few months ago and now I'm posting the episode up now. I don't remember if we actually discussed this in this episode or not, but here's the pearl I want to share with you. Sometimes when you have a patient in front of you, a new patient, and you're not 100% sure of the treatment plan, like you don't know whether you should do a fiber post and a crown or you should do an extraction an implant or whether or not you should have orthodontics or not, and whether or not you should remove that wisdom tooth or not as part of this bigger picture for that patient. 
Sometimes we agonize over it and we agonize and we agonize and we think and we think and we think and then we present the treatment option. We seem unsure. We present it in a high pitched tone. We present it with these facial expressions that is not going to fill the patient with confidence. So my advice that I learned from Lincoln is just go with your first plan. Like make a plan that you think is appropriate, that's clinically appropriate. Go with that one. Yes, you can refine it later. Yes, you can come back to the patient later, say, you know, I had a think and I'm suggesting this, that and the other. Or sometimes if, if a case is too complex, you can always say, hey, let me think about it. But then when you're at home and you're treatment planning it, just go with a reasonable plan. You don't have to agonize over, you know, 10, 15 different scenarios like I used to. I used to do this. I used to be like, oh, I don't know what to do. Should I do a bridge, a denture, blah, blah. And then when I stopped doing that and I just went for, okay, here's what my gut instinct says from all the knowledge I've gained from courses, from all the mentors I've been taught by, here's what I think today. Now, a few years later from now, I might think different. But according to what I believe today, according to my perception of dentistry right now, here's what I believe. And as long as you care for the patient and you meet their goals, then I think you can't go wrong. So that's what Lincoln taught me. I'm passing it straight over to you guys. So let's just jump in right to the episode. And before we do, I want to wish you all a really happy new year. Thanks for making 2020 great for the podcast. I know so much has gone in the world and I don't want to you know, sound like a, a broken record here and you know, echo what everyone else is saying about an unprecedented year and the pandemic and whatnot. It's been a crazy year, okay? I wish you and your family all the best, all the best for 2021. I hope you have a fantastic year. I think we realize more than anything that health is wealth and I really hope that you have a stronger and better 2021 and this damn virus will shut the hell up. Uh, let's just join Lincoln Harris because I'm going to shut up now. Thank you. Lincoln, welcome to the, the Protrusive Journal podcast. It is amazing to have you on. Thank you so much for having me. It's been, uh, you know, I've known you for a while and it's good to catch up. It actually, it's quite funny doing podcasts because it's just like uh, someone said, Oh, have you got to do that work? And I said, it's just like talking to someone you know for an hour and then you call it a podcast. That's it. And then that, that's, a, I mean, I had a, a Mike Melkers on here as well. He's obviously a, a buddy of ours, mutual buddy of ours. Uh, and it's just like that, you know, with these, with these great clinicians uh, that I respect so much. And it's just uh, amazing to have you guys on. In fact, for you, Link, uh, this yellow background is for you. So you're the first Australian, first Aussie I'm having on the podcast. Right. So what, we're having yellow screen. We're having a yellow screen behind me for, for, for that very reason. So uh, it's, it's an absolute honor to have you on. Now, for those people listening right now... Is that to remind you like of the sandy beach or the deserts of the central whatever? They're red, by no, the way. Or... Well, <laughs> it, 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 it's your color, right? You know, they're the Australian cricket team. I love cricket. Do you like cricket? Uh, so cricket, that's a game where you have like sticks and you hit balls with them or something? I, I, I sense what you're saying. <laughs> <laughs> there's two there's two games people get interested in. one one they have a ball and a stick and the other one they just have a ball yeah i'm talking about the one with the stick as well yeah right righto, righto. <laughs> so, righto. Uh, no i i don't know very much about cricket well actually to be fair this will offend uh obviously a good portion of your audience but uh, as a child i found yeah. the cricket ball quite hard and i didn't really fancy trying to stand in the way of its progress towards the ground uh lest I miss and and its hardness was inflicted on my face so I uh, uh, I never really took to cricket for some reason maybe just because yeah. I'm not very good at catching well that, that, you know if you get hit with a cricket ball that's, that's trauma enough from a young age but uh, for, you know obviously you're Australian but there's so much more to you than that Lincoln which is exactly why I wanted to bring you on for those people uh, listening and watching right now uh, very few people probably some of the newer grads maybe that's my perception who don't know uh, who you are well I'm going to give a small introduction in, in my own way uh, of you and then I'd like you to tell the more uh, official one if you like so so Lincoln to me you are someone who I've been learning from for many years. I saw you create the Facebook group, Restorative Implant Practice Excellence, uh, some years ago. How many years has it been? Uh, five. Five, five years ago. So I've been qualified seven years. Yes, I remember in my uh, first year out of dent school, actually joining this group, and uh, I loved what it was about. Um, everyone posting full protocol, uh, moving away from just the before and after. I, I love the, the ethos behind it. So since then, I've been following what you what you write because you, you're a good writer. You blog uh, your videos. Your Restoring Excellence Academy. I went to uh, I flew from Singapore when I lived there to to Sydney to see you in Pasquale. Uh, and when you came to Singapore, I uh, I, I came to your RETP course, and that's where I took this photo. Um, do you remember this photo? 
Okay, yeah, yeah. I, 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 I think we should put that photo away. It's, it's a pretty dodgy photo. <laughs> well, yeah, yeah. That's okay, sure. I, I want anyone who's looking at this photo, anyone who sees this photo, to know that it was not my idea. It was yours. <laughs> It, it, okay. no, this photo would be far worse if I was facing the other way, so it's, it's not too bad. <laughs> too far. Look, it's early in the morning here. Like at night, it's night over there, but this is before breakfast here, so you need to. You know, <laughs> you need for to those of me. you, for those of you who are not culturally aware, this is Lincoln giving me an Indian blessing. So that this is a, I was blessed by Lincoln, and I'll never forget uh, that, that blessing. So Lincoln, that's my crappy introduction of you. Please uh, tell the few people at home who don't know who you are a little bit about yourself and what you do. Uh, so, I'm a general dentist. Uh, I've always had a general practice in the same place for 20 years. And uh, all I try to do is dentistry the way I was taught, which is actually a lot harder than it sounds. Uh, and I have had a few educational adventures along the way. So, I think this is like my third evolution of educational adventures. And so, currently, uh, I'm a dentist part of the time. And the other part of the time, I teach and run a, a, a teaching company that's where our really our goal is to bring education closer to the dentist so instead of dentists traveling so far to get education we bring the education to them so that's that's where I am now and uh, <clears throat> I have been very fortunate to get many benefits from dentistry uh, and look different personalities cope dentistry is a tough business it, it's a very very difficult uh, profession it is difficult technically it's difficult emotionally and it's it's <clears throat> uh it's difficult you can do quite well financially but that's also not easy so it, it's it is uh difficult on every level and so you know part of it part of it is helping people understand that that actually is normal so a lot of when i teach it, when i teach it's you know, it, it, it's normal to struggle in dentistry because it's really hard. It's not, it's not that there's something wrong with you and everyone else is just sailing along. It's just a really, it's a really difficult thing to do and to do it well is, is even more so. So, you know, that, that, that's really what pushes me every day is to, one, do the best I can for my patients and two, to help other people do the best they can whilst acknowledging that dentistry is tough it takes training it's stressful it's some people I know get trapped in the profession like they, they're earning a good living but they don't really like it and you know, mm. if I can help a few people not end up that way that that would be great but that's that probably happens in every profession to be fair that's true, but I, I, I like your, your mission. I think it's very noble. Uh, and I think what we're going to be talking about is, is exactly this stuff, the bigger picture type stuff. Because when I was thinking about, okay, so if, if Link's going to come on the podcast, um, there's so much, literally so much you've taught me over the years the, um, from tiny things like um, stopping he bleeding of, of, of your, you know, when you're trying to, uh, trying to impress or take a scan or for, for a crown and uh, everything's profusely bleeding, little hacks by using, you know, um, what, what's your I'm trying to think what the fa my favorite is viscous that clear that's it viscous that clear soak it in there leave it for a while and all those little clinical gems that I've picked up but if I just focused on that I think I'd be doing a disservice because I think for, for, for you I wanted to focus on the bigger picture stuff so I'm going to go through with you just 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 five of the, the, the of the many many hundreds of things you've taught me uh, the bigger picture type stuff because I think if I if we can download this these sort of core principles that you've taught me into uh, some of my listeners and watchers, that would be, uh, I think that would make a great episode. Okay, well, I'll, I, will, uh, <clears throat> I will do my best to come along for the ride. I know you will. So we're going to start straight away. So number one thing that you taught me, this was when, um, this is something I learned from the blogs that you write, but then also when I came on your RETP, so that's Rapid uh, Efficient Treatment Planning course uh, when I saw you in Singapore. And this is basically... When I am communicating with my patients and I'm presenting a treatment plan, when I was a, a few years qualified, I'd noticed that sometimes their body language was changed as I'm speaking to them. And sometimes these, 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 these men, typically these men, would start folding their arms, okay? And mm -hmm. I was trying to think to myself, wait, what is happening? Uh, and, and I saw myself losing control of the conversation and I feel like I wasn't being listened to anymore. And then when you taught me that actually this patient is going through grief, Mm -hmm. and, and yeah. that was a real yeah. light bulb moment for me so please can you just tell us about grief the stages of grief and how it applies yeah. to communication treatment planning uh 
it's not actually how it applies to treatment planning, it's how it applies to everything. No. Uh, so, so first of all, you need to understand what grieving is because we associate grieving with death, okay? But grieving is not death. Grieving is a sudden shocking change in your life. So, and that can be different levels, okay? It can be like more shocking or less shocking, but anything that it causes us to suddenly go, oh, wow, you know, like to stop and things that we thought were true are suddenly not can cause grief. So <clears throat> things that can cause grief besides the loss of a loved one, um, okay, a whole bunch of dentists around the world suddenly got confronted with the fact that their practice was going to be shut for six weeks or eight weeks or 12 weeks and they didn't know how long, okay? That's a sudden shocking change in your life and <clears throat> so you will go through grief. So first, the first thing you're going, you know, and, and you need to understand the stages of grief are not a fixed pattern that you follow step by step in equal amounts of time. Like you might skip one stage, go straight to another stage, or you might do all the stages backwards, or you might get stuck in a stage for months and months and years and become bitter and angry and depressed and whatever. Okay. But, <clears throat> uh, you know, the, obviously there's usually an element of denial. Like we will all recognize this in ourselves that when we were told our practices, we started to get the idea, our practices might shut. We're all going, no, they won't. No, it's not necessary. It's not going to happen. You know, it, this is just going to be like the flu, uh, all of that sort of stuff. <clears throat> okay, so that's, and then you can get angry and go, this is ridiculous, you know, and, and uh, start trying to blame people and so on. And so this can happen in treatment planning as well. So the patient comes to us and they may well think that they're, we, we never know how much other things cost in general. Like we know for retail stuff because you can see it online. But if you go to the stonemason and ask him to do a new bench top made out of stone, you just often this we, we can't appreciate the cost in another person's business. And so we can have uh, we can have ideas that are completely unrealistic and our patients have this too so they come to us and they might be thinking i want my teeth fixed i've got a budget of five thousand that's a lot for me and then you start talking about well not only are your teeth got problems but they've got more problems than you thought and now you've got a problems with your occlusion which is a word they don't understand and then next thing you're talking about four times more so that that what you've done is you've given the patient a large and shocking change. And if you do that to a patient for whatever reason, okay, I see you folding your arms right there. But uh, <laughs> uh, <coughs> if you do that for whatever reason, you can push a patient into grief and they will go into denial. Like, I don't really need this dentistry. You're just trying to rip me off. Or anger, that's ridiculous. Uh, or, you know, depression. Oh, my teeth are terrible. I'm just going to give up mm -hmm. and let them all mm -hmm. fall apart. Or you know, uh, bargaining, like, well, maybe, and we'll see a lot of bargaining with patients. So they go, well, you know, maybe it costs that much to fix it properly, but can you just, like, can you just patch up my front tooth that's fallen out three times? Okay. Yeah, so definitely seen we'll see this patients. pattern. Yeah. And so that, that is essentially your goal during communication and treatment planning <clears throat> is to never trap the patient in the corner with grief. So you need to uh, think about how you communicate with them gently and give them space and time to adjust. Okay, And that also goes for not just good communication, but actually it's just good sales. So really, so here's the thing. You'll hear patients come in and they go, I hate veneers because they always look terrible. And what you actually say to the patient is, you only hate bad veneers because good veneers you don't notice. Mm -hmm. Okay. So <clears throat> people say, I don't want to be a salesman in dentistry. Well, you only notice sales when it's bad. When someone is really, really good at sales, they just seem like a really helpful person who solves your problems. So awesome. that's what good sales is a good sales is a great thing to be you know you listen you work out how you can help someone and you do it with sensitivity to their budget that's good sales okay <clears throat> so uh, but bad sales you notice like bad sales is trying to push something down someone's throat and that's uh, <clears throat> you know that that that's not 
So you, you don't notice, that's why we often have this bad idea about people who sell because we only notice it when it's bad. And, mm-hmm. and so it's, so from a, also from a pure sales theory, uh, people, the vast majority of people are not ready to buy for 60 to 90 days after they talk to someone about a new product or service that's, you know, a significant purchase. So it just so happens that if you go through a treatment planning process properly and methodically and allow the patient space and time and so on, which helps avoid pushing them into grief. Uh, so, you know, then it also from a, uh, it just happens that that also uh, correlates with the ideal amount of time from pure, like straight up sales theory, like, and, and probably they've worked that out somewhere along the way that, that people need time. Okay. Uh, mm-hmm. <clears throat> I don't know. And this is very hard to do, particularly when you're younger. It's extremely difficult when you're uh, inexperienced and you're not busy to be patient and take the time and let the patient take the time. So this is uh, like I couldn't it, do it. It almost goes against the, the, the grain of what some of the, 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 the gurus, the sales gurus teach you in terms of uh, the, the, the C word, you know, closing. Uh, and then that's where you came in and you explained the, the fact that, yes, these patients are grieving and to recognize uh, the stages of grief in our patients and then to give them space. Um, so, so it almost goes against what they teach, which leads us nicely to uh, the second lesson, actually, uh, which is beautifully leads it, is that when treatment plans get more complex, slow down. Uh, and and the, the conversely, when a treatment plan simple, <clears throat> just just be quick, and and that really yeah. really helped me to gain clarity when when I was treatment planning and communicating to my patients. Yeah, and, and also the reverse is true. If you're really fast, you'll only do simple treatment plans. If you slow down, your treatment plans will become more complex. So watch out. So if you don't <laughs> like doing complicated dentistry, don't do good consultations. Uh, <laughs> uh, that's absolutely true. And look, that it's so obvious. It's obvious to me now. It wasn't always. <clears throat> like imagine any significant purchase. So, you know, when we start doing complex dentistry, it's as much as a car. Okay. Sometimes it's a good car. Sometimes it's a secondhand <laughs> leader. But it's, it's a significant expenditure. Yep. And you can't just go, well, it's an investment in your health and all this nonsense. Okay. It's, it doesn't, you know, like, there's people who can't afford good oncology who die because they don't have enough money. And you're thinking there that you can convince someone to have enough money for dentistry if they don't have enough money. That's silly. So, uh, <clears throat> But certainly any significant thing that we spend money on in our life, most people, there's a few who won't, like about 5 or 10%, but the vast majority of people will want to think about it for some time and they will need to understand it fully. So for sure, you should slow down. Now, my practice now has slowly progressed from a straight up general practice to one where the vast vast majority of my patients are complex. And and you can, look, you don't need to take, you can slow down by using staff if you want to. You can train staff to do the slowing down process for you so they can do some of the records and things and they can draw out the process if you don't personally want to spend the time with the patient over that period. But for sure, you can't talk about really complex dentistry. Now, there's a couple of reasons why you can't. In most well-regulated countries, if you don't spend the time, you're not going to get proper informed consent. Mm -hmm. It's just just how it is. And what took me a really long time to realise is that informed consent is not a... It is not a thing that gets between you and the treatment plan that you want to do, okay? Because first of all, if you really want to do a treatment plan, you are um, treating yourself, you're not treating the patient. Brilliant. Uh, But if you do informed consent really well, you actually get happier patients and you generally do better work. So, so, uh, you know, and like sometimes people say, well, you know, if I tell the patient all of this stuff, like, you know, all the things that could go wrong and so on, they might not go ahead. And I go, well, that, that is actually the point of informed consent. It's not, it's not, it's not how do I do a procedure and, you know, cover myself legally uh, and convince the patient to do it anyway because I want to. It's actually, you know, this is your chance to say no. And 
But when you do that with a, a genuine intention, then the patient will just recognize that you're trying to do the best you can. So <clears throat> a lot of, the, and this comes, I'd like to tell you that this is because of great wisdom, but it's actually just because I've made mistakes. You know, uh, I've, yeah, of course, of course. You know, I've uh, done big treatment plans with inadequate informed consent. And well, it's like Warren Buffett says, you know, when the tide goes out, you see who's wearing pants. So, you know, <laughs> <clears throat> when the complaint comes, you see who's got good informed consent because you don't care about informed consent until someone makes a complaint or there's a problem, or they go to another dentist who says your work wasn't good, or they go to a regulator, and then you're going through your notes and you go, oh my goodness, we didn't write anything, you know, I haven't got document, I haven't got signed things, I haven't mm -hmm. got anything signed, you know, one case I had, uh, she complained that about the cost of an implant or something, and we had a dispute, and I went through, and there wasn't like, there was no clear piece of paper. There was like a piece of paper that had the cost of the implant on it. But it was all just, you know, I felt embarrassed looking at it. So watch, you don't want to feel embarrassed when you reread your notes in two years' time. And if you do all that really well, if you spend the time to document properly and to, to thoroughly explain what you're trying to do and why you need to do it and give the patient time to think about it and don't let the patient make rushed decisions. So I remember in the... 10 years ago, I used to be on Dental Town a lot. Uh, and, you know, there, there, it was, there was a bit of a trend at that time of, you know, the, the patient wants veneers, I need to get them in the chair this Saturday before they change their mind. And now I think, oh you know, my gosh. what are we thinking? <laughs> you know, no way. You, if you want the patient to change their mind before you do the veneers, not after, like when they're going, you know what, I'm not sure I wanted to do this. I think it was your idea. And then like you're in trouble. So. So a lot of the slowing down actually just comes from me learning to do informed consent properly. And then from that, I started to see the benefits to patient acceptance. So my patient acceptance, my treatment acceptance is super high. It's like 95%, even for mm -hmm. expensive stuff. Uh, mm -hmm. <clears throat> Can I ask you a question on, on, on that note, right? So um, when you're getting informed consent from a patient, let's say you're going to be doing um, eight upper veneers, uh, a, 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 a small cosmetic case, you know, eight upper <clears> veneers <throat> maybe, uh, and you're consenting that patient, uh, what techniques, what consent methods, uh, for example, I, I'm not a massive fan of, of uh, signed documents. I don't think they're, wor I, I don't think they're worth the paper uh, they're, they're, you know, they're printed on. However, to, to satisfy the regulators, we may you know, need that. But that, that doesn't necessarily mean the patient has actually understood what's gone wrong. So what techniques do you employ to make sure you have got that good consent that, you know, like you say, contributes to patients liking you and, 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 and saying yes because they, they trust you? So just to back up, the, the, they trust you, but also you set that the purpose of informed consent is to give realistic expectations. That's really the purpose of it. So if you want to not use the word informed consent, let's just use the term setting realistic expectations that you won't that. disappoint, okay? That's what informed consent really is about, okay? Like there is a small chance that you could have a numb lip. That's setting an expectation, okay? I'll do the procedure, but there is a percentage chance that you'll have a numb lip for the rest of your life, which unless you're a saxophonist or a singer, you'll probably live with. So that's what informed consent is. It, it really needs to be thought of as setting expectations. Um, <clears throat> There is a reason why you should do written things that people sign, okay? And that is because people absorb information differently depending on who they are. Mm -hmm. I am a auditory learner, auditory and visual. So I never take notes in lectures, okay? I just listen and I look and then like for surgical procedures, I can watch someone do it and then I can do it and not as good, but I learn by watching and hearing. Uh, I have right behind me on the shelves a textbook that is still in its plastic wrapping. It's a, it's a great textbook, okay? People have told me how great it is, okay? It's still <laughs> in its plastic wrapping. And that's not that I don't learn by reading, it's just that it's not my preferred method. But for other people, it is. So you can imagine me being an auditory person and a, a very good at verbalizing things. I want to teach the patient all the stuff by speaking. 
but not all patients learn very well that way. So <clears throat> this, and there's a lot of things they forget, like they come in a week later. You know, I had a patient recently and I, he said, so are you saying my denture is going to be removable, not fixed on the implants? And I said, yes, that's right, because if you remember our conversation, the fixed option was going to be another, you know, $10,000 or something and you couldn't afford it. So we're going to do a removable option at this point. <clears throat> the patient had forgotten. So the reason you do written is to cover more types of communication. So for me, doing a, so first of all, eight veneers is not a small cosmetic treatment plan for me. <laughs> okay, so. No, I, 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 not, thought, I thought I'm for you, I was posh. thinking more in, in terms of you. I was, I was thinking more in terms of you because I see all the uh, full large cases that you do. So I, I was thinking in the mindset that, okay, for, for Lincoln, eight, 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 eight upper units will be nothing. So that, that was the, uh, the where no. I was coming from. <laughs> Sometimes eight units, you can spend nearly as long doing them as, <laughs> but, uh, <clears throat> and it can be a lot of work in eight units. Uh, but the, mm. Uh, yeah, so I have, first of all, the most important thing is you kind of got to be slightly paternalistic, which is you've actually got to, uh, first of all, satisfy in yourself that the patient understands what you're talking about and that they are actually wanting this procedure. <clears throat> I quite commonly tell the patient, I'm not sure if you're ready for this. Okay, And this is very difficult to do without a lot of experience. So mm -hmm. I'm not sure that you could do it two or three years out, but... Uh, and there's a whole bunch of things that I won't let the patient go ahead for. So, you know, like if they come in for implants and they've got uncontrolled periodontal disease and they smoke, okay, those two things, okay, I can cope with the smoking if their gums are perfect, but I cannot cope smoking and perio together, absolute contraindication. And so one of those two things changes, <clears throat> well, preferably both, but at least... You know, if they smoke but their gums are perfect, I can cope with that. Mm -hmm. If they have perio and they smoke, absolutely no go. And the, and this you might say, well, that's, you know, very wise, Link, and that's because I did a full arch implant case, which I've now removed six years later, and we'd lost 50% of the bone in two years. So, <clears throat> um, you know, that, that, that type of thing is very hard to learn. So, yeah. Uh, what we were talking about, informed consent and how I do written. So stuff. I was just saying, yeah, yes. I mean, uh, I think I, I love the way that you phrase it into um, realistic expectations to the patient. Uh, and just uh, so we also touched on the, the, I mentioned about the forms. I'm not a big fan of them, uh, but you, you raise a good point that, you know, people are different. People absorb information in different ways. So I, I, I take your point and I respect that. Uh, is there anything else that you want to touch on in terms of um, slowing down uh, and uh, consent forms, how to, how to actually how to actually get the consent in terms of, you know, is it just forms? Are there any other techniques that you might use? Uh, so <clears throat> there's a few things. Mm. Obviously, almost every single one of my patients has a full set of photos, so we're going to show them their teeth on the photos. That, that also is part of the both the consent and the acceptance process because people are very visual these days and they... If you show them their teeth with a big hole in it, there's just no doubt that it needs treating. Okay, and actually, most people think their teeth are worse than they really are. So that's you show people a really healthy set of teeth, and they go yuck, okay, because they don't they think their teeth are all white and they're full of stains and stuff. So <clears throat> the the consent process for me involves photographs. I show mm -hmm. them all the radiographs. Uh, it takes time, and the more complex the treatment, the more time it takes. So it's not uncommon for me to have spent two hours with a patient before we lay a scalpel or a burr on their tooth. So, uh, and it, uh, often the consent process also involves preliminary treatment to see whether you can stabilize the mouth. So it's very common as part of my consent process or realistic expectations or just good professional behavior, uh, to put the patient through say a perio program or an oral hygiene program or a caries reduction program <clears throat> and see how that goes. And so there's a lot of my patients who I basically come in going, I want a makeover or I want to, essentially what they're asking for is a rehab and I'm saying not until your mouth is clean, okay? Mm -hmm, so, mm -hmm. so because now you go, oh, that's pretty tough to, you know, look that much, you know, a, a wheelbarrow full of money in the eye and say no, but actually... <laughs> All you need to think about is how much fun it would be to do that dentistry and then give the money back. 
Yeah, yeah, well. Okay. It's not very hard. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So you, you, it's not that hard to, it's not that hard to. And, you know, it has a side benefit. <clears throat> when you stop trying to rush, okay. So right now, like we've come out of corona, my practice is booked up. Okay, we've got tons of new patients, super busy. When I say tons of new patients, tons of new patients for me is not the same as some other practice. So I hear people say like I see 50 new patients a month, whereas for me a busy week is I see like four to six new patients a week. Uh, um, but the benefit of slowing down is, first of all, your acceptance rate tends to go up. Secondly, you start to get really busy, but you won't start to get really busy for about six to 12 months after you start this process because it takes time for the machinery to start working its way around. Mm -hmm. <clears throat> and thirdly, from a large corporation point of view, the best way for a dentist to operate is to have a space tomorrow because you can fit in a new patient in a way that requires no loyalty. So if you have a toothache, the patient will go pretty much anywhere to get it fixed. From a dentist's mindset point of view, being booked up for two or three weeks is far better. So dentists do their best work when they're not worried about filling tomorrow's thing. So their best consultations occur when they're booked up. And how do you get booked up? Well, <clears throat> I can tell you how not to get booked up. How not to get booked up is to massively expand your practice and put on 10 more staff when you, the moment you get slightly busy. Uh, so, so once you start getting busy and you start to getting a little bit of a waiting list to see you, don't be too quick to, yeah, yeah. you know, put on another dentist mm -hmm. unless that's your goal. I mean, if you want to become a business owner with a large stable of dentists, then go for it, you know, and that's acceptable and it's appropriate for a lot of patients but if you really love your dentistry and you really want to do stuff that's a little bit more you know complex and a little bit more challenging then don't be in a hurry to add more capacity because brilliant so, so that, that's not rushing in, in in both those ways so that's lesson number two when treatment plans get more complex complex slow down and generally not to rush and you put some uh, really lovely gems in there about the consent process which i'm sure people gain a lot of value from uh, you touched in there about the value of photos so i'm actually going to skip to number five of the, <clears throat> of the five things which is um you taught me to take photos of every patient every time now i was already good at taking photos but it was you know you're very strict with me you said to me jazz you must take photos every patient every time and repeat every patient every time and when I got into that discipline it, it just you know makes sense so I mean a lot of my listeners and watchers already know I'm, I've said many episodes for the importance of taking photos and whatnot um he just briefly summarized to, to those new grads maybe just the value and how much we can improve by taking photos oh look it, it's it's and look there's probably some some you know probably soon we'll have some way to video the teeth or scan them or whatever but the <clears throat> First of all, we weren't the ones who can't, like orthodontists have done this for a long time. So you might think of orthodontists as like the original cosmetic dentists, okay? They, every single one of their patients is documented. And, and in fact, a lot of specialists, you know, prosthodontists, everything. So, you know, if you go into high level specialties, then you have to document everything to this level all the time. <clears throat> and, they, and they do it for good reason because you actually can sit there and ponder the case, you can follow the case, you have a track record. Like you're never going to remember what the disto buckle cusp of the 2.7 looked like in five years' time when the patient comes in and you're trying to work out whether it's got worse or not. So <clears throat> there's, there's many benefits. For me, number one is I can plan better off a photo than I can in the mouth. This is because of the nature of our eyes. Our eyes have tunnel vision. We always, our eyes are very bad camera and there's only a tiny spot right in the middle that has high definition. And also our eyes have a massive computer program behind them that lies to us. For instance, right now, everyone who, almost everyone in the world can see their nose all the time, but your brain filters your nose out. And now that I've said that, you notice that you can see your nose. So, uh, and our brain filters out the, part of the eye where the nerve comes in it filters out all the blood vessels and all of this where it's just like patching over the information with an extrapolation and it, and anytime you're doing say cricket your eye is not actually telling you what you see it's telling you what it thinks you will see in about 
you know, 60 milliseconds time to allow you to have time to react to stuff so you don't get run over by buses and hit in the head by cricket balls. Otherwise, you would actually not be able to catch a ball. So <laughs> our eyes lie. <clears throat> so photos pretty much don't unless they're being photoshopped. Uh, and so the photo forces you to see everything. If you look at a photo of someone's mouth, you go, oh, look. Like when you look at it with your, just your eye, you focus on one thing. You go, oh, look at the big chip on their front tooth. And you're ignoring the fact that there's blood pouring out of their gums on the other side of the mouth. And so you take a photo, it forces you to look at everything. Uh, and, and you'll also notice this because you'll go to a wedding and you'll take a photo of the bride and groom. And then you get home and look at the photo and you'll realize there's a palm tree growing out of the groom's head, which you never notice when you were taking the photo, okay? Because like, there's one right behind their head and it looks like there's a tree growing out of the head. But when you are there, you never notice that. So the photograph, you can see more because it shows you everything all at once and it doesn't tend to draw the eye to one thing so you ignore everything else. And secondly, the process of taking photos trains your eye to see more because the moment you take the photo, you realize there's a, like that the photo doesn't look very good because there's a whole bunch of problems. There's, you know, like you, you cut out an amalgam to do a composite and you take a picture of the tooth and you think, oh, that's a lovely cavity prep. And then you look at it and immediately you notice there's stain everywhere all over the margins, the fissures, there's amalgam dust all over the rubber dam. And this attention to detail you can't see. So you, you can see better when you take photos. Communication is better. You can show the patient, they're very visual. It's very, very easy to show someone that their teeth are worn when there's a picture of their teeth being worn right in front of them on a 60 inch television. <clears throat> um, for planning, you can use it for smile design. You can follow cases, I have cases. Uh, I just saw a patient yesterday. I saw her the first time in 2009 when she was mid teens or late teens. <clears throat> and now I'm seeing her again. And I can actually look, she has, uh, uh, ironically for this she has a protrusive pattern of parafunction uh, with uh, like she has every sign of high levels of occlusal activity that you could imagine so she's got brachyfacial she's got large masseters she's got uh, huge lingual tori she's got thick bone around her teeth she's got teeth that are generally flattened her incisors are shortened uh she has significant pain in her temporalis and all up the top of her head where the temporalis attaches. So she's got everything. <clears throat> and so then I can look at the photo from 2009 and go, have her teeth worn significantly or not? You, you could never remember that. And it also saves time. Okay, regulations are different in every country, but I've looked at the regulation here. It doesn't say you have to chart teeth. It says you need to record the teeth appropriately. Uh, and so in Australia, recording the teeth appropriately there is nowhere that it says you have to sit there, go on a little diagram of a tooth that looks like a circle with sides, which is not representative of a tooth, and click a button on the mesial to show a mesial filling. Uh, like Compared to a photograph where you can see that that's amalgam filling <clears throat> or it's a composite filling or it's not actually on the contact, it's on the buccal cusp but on the mesial end of the buccal cusp. From a from a forensic point of view, as much more, so it saves time. It's Th that was a, a paradigm benefit. shift for me, Link. When, when I saw you do the the live exam on your RETP <clears throat> course, uh, and you had to go look around for a couple of minutes, and then uh, a, you know a decent look around, and then you had all the photos, and and you you sort of said that exactly what you said there. Why are we charting teeth? You know. Um, I still haven't got to a stage where I can quite implement it in the, in, in the UK. Uh, we're just so used to going through our system of charting, you know, the mesial and the middle and whatnot. But I, in my ideal world, I would like to follow your model. I, I think I think it's great to, to have a good close look, but then have the photos and then the, the nurse can just follow along and the assistant can follow on, along and just uh, do the charting for you. Uh, it just makes so much more sense. And you can give the rest of the consultation for the things that matter, i.e. Yeah. informed consent. Yeah. So the thing that's interesting actually is that my exam process, it's, so in a, <clears throat> in a standard, and, and RETP, the, the, uh, the, the online version is on ripeglobal.com now. Mm. So you, you, if you uh, can't ever come to the live one, and we're about to change the live one to be much more comprehensive and, and focus more on really complex stuff rather than just the whole range of things because <clears throat> the original RETP is online now. So. Uh, can, can I just uh, say, say as well for, for, for those listening and watching? We're not, we're, we're, I paid a lot of money for RETP and I got every penny's worth. I mean, I don't know how many sixteen hundred dollars, seventeen hundred dollars, how much ever it was, and it was so worth it for me. Uh, it was a great program, uh, and then. 
part of you know you know when you uh, launched Right Global, and I was like, wait, wait, for thirty dollars, I get to access the whole uh, RETP and all those other full day programs, which, by the way, uh, I, I paid also thousands of dollars for. Hi guys, I just want to interfere into this episode and just tell you about Ripe Global and uh, uh, Luke from Ripe Global. He has very kindly given the producerati a discount code, so I'm just going to read these out. So uh, you can get. I mean, I'm sure you've all seen Ripe Global. They're everywhere on Facebook, social media, all these amazing cases, video content, free monthly masterclasses. I mean, what's not to like? It's been fantastic. But I'm going to share some coupon codes that Luke has kindly provided so you guys, the Petrusarati, can get a discount. So if you want to join the standard monthly membership and you've been umming and ahhing, now is the time. You can use the code RIPELEARN, that's R-I-P-E, L-E-A-R-N, Ripe Learn, to get 20% off their monthly membership. If you want to pay a, a year in advance, you get 30% off, and that's Ripe Annual is the coupon code, Ripe Annual. And if you want to get 30% off the premium annual memberships to get extra videos, extra content, it's Ripe Jazz. Jazz is, is J-A-Z, just one Z. So Ripe Jazz. And again, if you go to protrusive.co.uk, uh, to the episode, you, just under the show notes, you will have access to all these codes in case you join later. But the, the expiry for all these coupon codes is 31st of January 2021. So if you're listening a few years later, I'm sorry you miss out. So if you've been sitting on the fence, now is the time to, to really capitalize on this uh, coupon code for the Petrusarati and join and watch these amazing clinicians share dentistry in a way you've never seen before. Uh, but then also, because I hadn't done Alina's program. I hadn't done several other programs. So, okay, it was still like if I, you know, I wasn't kicking myself all that much because there was still so much for me to gain from that. But I just thought the, the, the value of, of that was just mind-blowing. Yeah, I look, it, <clears throat> it is. It should, and, and look, the, the best way to do something is to do something that has a good purpose and our, our purpose is to make education more widely available at a price that people can afford uh, and and to make it better. So, uh, <clears throat> you know, and you can do that with online when you have the ability to scale. And, and uh, so Ripe Global is, is really built around that idea that we can make education both better and more accessible and less expensive. Uh, but you can only do that with scale. So that, yeah, that's, of course. you know, you can't do that being expensive. So, uh, and it has been, you know, it's been going terrifically well. But the, um, so RETP is online there, but the, the, that, that, the key part is that the, you can do a very thorough exam. So my standard exam is uh, most of my patients have a complex issue. So they're going to need a full arch radiograph. So anyone who mentions implants or any type of complex, I'm going to get a cone beam. Uh, like I'm just not, once you get used to cone beams with your treatment planning, you just really can't do without it. And people go, well, you know, a lot of people like to then have a song and dance about radiation. First of all, the amount of radiation that we generate in a patient's life compared to like medical people is inconsequential. That's the first thing. And secondly, very rare for a dentist to get sued for taking further records. It's very common for them to get sued for not taking not further taking, records, yeah. and I'll give you an example of not further records that I've I haven't been sued for, but which I have had stressful moments over and paid money out on, uh, <clears throat> and that's where an implant goes missing. So, like you place an implant, and then a week later it's gone, and so the obvious thing is it somehow fallen into the patient's mouth, and they haven't noticed it, uh, and. But the most common thing actually happens to it is it's gone into the sinus and in the sinus you can't get an x-ray of an implant unless you do a full arch uh, radiograph. And and so the first, I didn't realise this when I was inexperienced and I, because it's always when you're doing a simultaneous lift. <clears throat> so you do a simultaneous lift with implant and the lift pops and the implant or they put too much, but who knows what happens and the implant goes up into the sinus. And uh, if you take a, PA trying to find it because the patient's lying on their back, the implant has always fallen to the back of the sinus where you can't, mm -hmm. uh, you can't, yeah, you, you can you never get that on the next yeah. mm -hmm. Anyway, so, um, <clears throat> so it's always, almost always full arch radiograph of some sort, so an OPG or a cone beam, and then we take a full set of photographs and we do the same process pretty much every time because then it's really fast. Full set of photographs, which takes me like a minute, 40 seconds. Uh, I immediately give the camera to the assistant to upload the photos so they're done you, you, the you still I... take all your own photos link yeah 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 
Yeah, I do because I, I think about outsourcing it. Sometimes it gets outsourced when it's a patient. It comes in through therapy rather than through or what you'd call hygiene. So we have new patients that come in via the hygiene department. So they're just like your regular checkup type patients. And Caitlin will take the photos for them. But if the patient is coming in to see me, specifically, it usually means they're complex and I'll take it. Because while I'm taking the photo, I'm looking at their teeth and starting to think. Mm -hmm. So it doesn't really help me that much to have someone else take the photo. Sure. And it still takes, <clears throat> you know, a minute, 30 seconds. And then in the chair, uh, if they've got any interproximal areas where I need radiographs like bite wings or PAs. <clears throat> now, I will tell you that I have a flat fee for new patients. So it's not expensive. Uh, it's just a single fee. It doesn't matter how many x-rays, photos, whatever. Everything in the first visit is included. <clears throat> and it's not expensive. So whilst the average treatment plan that I do is quite expensive, I am one of the least expensive for new patient consultations. Uh, now, this kind of goes against people's philosophies a little bit because they go, well, if the patient wants to do something extensive, they will pay a lot for a new patient exam. But actually not true because if you go and test drive a cheaper car, like a Kia or a Great Wall or something, <clears throat> okay, you, you won't pay to test drive it, okay? And that's a cost to the dealer. But if you go and test drive a Bentley, not only will you still not pay to test drive it, even though it costs a lot more to test drive a Bentley than a Kia, they will probably give you champagne and some nice French cheese to go with <laughs> it. Okay, so... When you're spending more, you don't actually expect to pay more for a consultation. You expect to pay less and get better service. So, <clears throat> so, uh, uh, yeah. So, <clears throat> and the other part of that is that when you have a flat fee, none of my patients have concerns about radiation of X-rays. But when they have to pay for every <laughs> single X-ray, okay. <laughs> oh, I never thought about that way. <laughs> when my patients pay for every single X-ray individually, a la carte they quite commonly have concerns <laughs> about if this is necessary, okay? So what I've discovered is actually there's a strong correlation between patients' radiation concerns and how much they're paying for the x-ray. So like they have big concerns for cone beams and it's not because of the, <laughs> the number of, you know, microsieverts they're getting. Yeah. It's because of the number of, of macro dollars they're paying. Anyway, so that's... um, uh, So... Whatever full arch radiographs I need. Now, sometimes you've actually got to look at their mouth and go, but most of my patients come in and go, look, I want an implant or I'm thinking about replacing my back teeth. I mean, you're never, ever going to do a consultation for anyone about replacing their back teeth without a cone beam. It would just be ridiculous. Yeah. Like, you know, unless they just had bone surgery for cancer and radiated their jaws and whatever. But even then, you'd probably still take one. So, um, yeah. Or maybe not because of the radiation will be an actual time to not use radiation if they've just had been irradiated for cancer. But yeah, so, but there will be some where I, there, and if I'm not sure, take an OPG. So if you're not sure whether you need an OPG or a cone beam, take an OPG because the, if you take an OPG and then you take a cone beam, the patient's got almost the same amount of radiation as a cone beam. But if you take a cone beam and they only need an OPG, well, then they've just got it like, you know, 10 times as much. So. Full arch radiographs if needed, photos, intraoral radiographs if needed, so I can look around the mouth very quickly and decide if they're needed. And I'm doing it in this order because those things take time to upload yeah. and to be available. Uh, then it's muscles of mastication, headache history, smoking history, TMJ assessment, uh, saliva glands, lymph nodes, soft tissue pathology check, uh, periodiagnosis, occlusal diagnosis, orthodiagnosis, uh, which we record all of that. And of course, the assistant is typing. So by the time I finish examining the notes are very comprehensive and done. <clears throat> and then I go back to the consultation. So the actual exam part of my, say one hour with a new patient who's got complex needs, the actual exam part, even though it's incredibly thorough and our notes are much more extensive than average, takes about five minutes. Yeah. Which leaves 55 minutes for finding out what their goals and concerns and what their long-term objectives with their mouth are. 
and then showing them the state of their mouth. And pretty much these days, I never ever treatment plan complex stuff on the first visit. So it's, <clears throat> I never would. I don't do it for a few reasons. I don't do it because I haven't had time to consent. You can't consent to complex procedures instantaneously. They haven't had time to understand what they want to do. Um, and it's just not effective. Like your, uh, I'm always going to treatment plan basic urgent care and then see them again for a second consultation in six to 12 weeks and almost never on the first visit. If you, if you present complex treatment plans on the first visit, your acceptance rate will be like 30, 40%. If you I've definitely go through a learned process, that first time myself, absolutely. Yeah, yeah. If you go through a process of being professional, as in like doing what a dentist should do, which is making sure they're healthy and stable and they can maintain their mouth before you do complex work and getting proper planning and taking your models and getting a diagnostic wax up and doing a mock-up to check that you haven't made them look like a horse and all of this stuff, that whole process takes time. And if you go through that whole process, your acceptance rate goes up massively. And one of the reasons it goes up is because if you give someone a treatment plan after six interactions with you and your team, so they've come in, they've seen me, they've seen my therapist, they've had perio done, they've had oral hygiene, they've had a couple visits with her, they've had some fillings done with her, I've done an endo that was urgent, and then they come back for a consultation after that amount of relationship, and I give them a treatment plan that's $27,000, and they can only afford $19,000. They're going to tell me, because they have enough relationship to say, it's too expensive, can we do something that's not so expensive? And most of the time you can. Mm -hmm. And so part of having really high acceptance rate is having enough communication interaction between you and the patient so that they can tell you whether it works for them or not. Now, sometimes you do have to say, look, this is not the right time in your life to do this because, you know, we this type of dentistry is better not to do until you can really do it well. And right at the moment, I'm going to make too many compromises. It would be better for you to spend nothing than to do a half a job. So let's keep you stable. We'll keep your maintenance cycle. We'll maintain your teeth as best we can, make sure you don't lose any more. Uh, but this is not the best time for you to do it because we have to make so many compromises. You probably won't be happy and you'll have still spent most of your money. I love that. And I think I'm going to make that the, the the snippet, the opening snippet of the podcast, what you just said there, because I think that's such a difficult thing to come to terms with, to say to a patient, just like you said earlier, you see you got the wheelbarrow of money, uh, sort of a analogy, if you like, you know, to actually <clears throat> say no, but for the right reasons. Um, I really love that. In the interest of time, Link, I've got to move on to the, the next points. Uh, how are you doing for time? Yeah, I'm fine. You're fine, time. yeah? Okay, fine. So we covered uh, those two. Um, let's talk about the fact that the patient in front of you, uh, there's no evidence for how to treat the patient that's in front of you. So you, do, you, you came to the UK and for tubules, you did a little bit about torpedoed by the literature uh, and uh, that, you know, that was a bit of flavor and also the RETP course as well. Um, you mentioned that there may be 72 ways to do a, a restoration, for example, uh, but there's no evidence to, to, to say what's the best for that patient, that unique patient in front of you. And when I absorbed that from you, um, I, I really started to go with my gut instinct. I, I, was, uh, I became better at just being a bit more decisive rather than really pondering every small nuances which really probably wouldn't make that big of a difference. So if you just expand briefly on that. So there's actually two parts to why you found it easier and one of them is communication. So the if you are ever unsure what to do, with a patient, you haven't asked the patient enough questions. Uh, you know, like if you're sitting there going, oh, I could do endo, um, but I could do an implant, but I could do endo, but then, you know, what if the endo doesn't work and then I have to do an implant? Well, ask the patient. It's very simple. You say, look, I think the, and as dentists, because we're not well-trained, so dentists are not well-trained, this is not a criticism of universities, they just don't have enough time. To train a dentist well will take about 12 years, okay? And we would, it would take as long as ophthalmology because what we do is about as hard as ophthalmology. We're a surgical specialist who is trained for as long as a general medical practitioner. Actually, less, less long than that. So there is a reason why you don't feel competent when you graduate, it's because you haven't been trained for long enough. Uh, so we don't have confidence as dentists for 
the early part of our career and often we keep that up for a lot of our career to actually tell the patient what's best because we get so trained in, you know, have to let the patient... We, we actually can't let the patient make the decision of what's the ideal treatment for them. We can let them be involved in the decision. They can guide us to what they want to achieve and they can say no. But if you have a patient who's got a tiny incisal corner off and then you offer them all the available options, including an extraction, and they say, well, just pull the tooth out, okay? <laughs> you can't, there is nowhere in the world it's defensible to say, well, the patient, I offer the patient all the options for their small distal incisal chip on their 2-1, and they chose to have their front tooth extracted. That's, so the idea, first of all, that you gave the patient all available options is not true. You never give the patient all available options. Secondly, the idea that you are removed from your responsibility in any way by what the patient chooses is also not true. So if you go to a surgical specialist for, say, a sore knee, and he looks at your knee and determines that you need an arthroscopy, okay, to do something or other. Uh, he doesn't give you 19 options. He gives you two, which is do the arthroscopy or don't do the arthroscopy. Okay, and so that that's <clears throat> the, most of the time in dentistry, we give people too many options and it's because we haven't listened. So now, uh, the problem with the word evidence-based dentistry or evidence-based medicine is that people forget what it is. So, and, and it would be better to be called knowledge-based dentistry because mostly there is not a study or a group of studies that directly relate to this patient. So you're taking your knowledge. So if you've read a lot of literature, you're taking that knowledge, uh, but it doesn't ever directly or almost never directly apply to that particular patient that's in front of you. So... Mm -hmm. uh, and because for it to do so, all of the patients in the study or studies, and there'll be like seven, there'll be like a hundred studies at least for one single clinical decision, uh, will all be on populations different to your patient. So unless that population of the study directly relates to the patient right in front of you right now, you know, they're all 37-year-old bricklayers uh, <clears throat> whose mother had severe caries and father had a denture from the age of 20, then... <laughs> You know, like there's too many variables. So, uh, but we also forget that if you look at when Guyatt and Sackett wrote the paper on evidence-based medicine, it was using the best available evidence and combining it with the patient's wishes and with your clinical experience. Okay, one third process of evidence-based medicine is the best available literature. Two thirds of evidence-based medicine is the patient and the practitioner. It's not 99% is the best available literature and 1% is the patient and the practitioner. That's absolutely not true and it is a misrepresentation of evidence base and and the word evidence is often used to argue with people without actually any support so if you want to argue with someone or like if someone says something and you don't want to believe them you just go show me the evidence <laughs> so you know it's it's a it's mostly a debating tactic uh, and a lot of the time when we go to a lecture and they show us evidence if you actually read the evidence it wouldn't support what they said anyway so it, it, it's quite commonly that they've only read the not always but often they've only read the abstract uh, and the abstract uh, sometimes the abstract doesn't even follow. So uh, you can't. So you, you do. All of us use the best evidence that we have available to us. Okay, and you can't read everything, particularly if you're a general practitioner. It's impossible. But what you can always do is spend more time listening to the patient. So and helping them understand the consequences. So what I like to do uh, in my practice is very simple. It's, you know, work out what the patient has, work out what they want, and find a way to get from what they have to what they want at a price they can afford. Wow, without, that's dentistry. <laughs> without 
long-term regrets. You always got to have that bit in there. It took me a long time to work that bit out without long-term regrets. So that means if someone comes into me and says, I want you to pull out all my teeth and do a full arch implant case because I'm sick of maintaining my teeth, I sit there and go, you do realise that you know, in 10 to 15 years time or 20 years time, all of your implants could be failing and I could be removing them, bone grafting and redoing them and that the teeth can fall off your fixed prosthesis and I could be redoing it and every time I fix your fixed prosthesis, it might cost $1,000 because I'm not going to guarantee it forever. A lot of maintenance cost. Can you afford that? And so that's the difference between a consultation where you go, you know, I'm meeting what they want at a price they can afford but without long-term regrets. So, you know, like... Uh, I get a lot of patients, a lot of ladies come in and they want nice teeth and they don't want ortho. And I go, well, you're 35. I have patients who are 95. If I cut your teeth up now, particularly that heavily, uh, you, when you're 45, you'll still want to look beautiful. And when you're 55, you'll still want to look beautiful. And if at 55, your teeth are all snapping off and I'm doing implants, which is great for me, you know, you will have regrets and I see a lot of deja vu I'm getting I'm getting flashbacks from RETP because yeah (laughs) I didn't I think when you were there I wasn't as long-term focused because I was still I still had to get slapped around by life experience a bit more before I could have some of these viewpoints this this is four years ago no this is exactly the sort of stuff you you taught me there and and that that, and, and the that exactly that exact dialogue where you know I know that when you're 55 you'll still want to look beautiful I remember the first time I said that to the patient, I felt like, yeah, it's Lincoln inside me. <laughs> no, it's, it's a really great thing to say to patients. I really do think it's a, it's a great way of putting it into perspective for the patient. You know, you still want to look good. Uh, yes, I know is where you want to look good, but I know that when you're this age, you'll also want to look good. And that just really, when I said that to patients, to like, oh, crap, you know, there's, there's, you can't argue against that. <laughs> yeah, yeah. And look, there, there are also cases, to be fair, where I have done ortho, and then I've done veneers and I should have just done veneers. Like you've got mild crowding. Sometimes you go, okay, I could put the patient through six or 12 months of ortho and then I do veneers and then I spend the rest of my life worrying that they will get relapse <laughs> okay, <laughs> of their orthodontic stakes after I've done veneers. And I should have just, you know, that tiny bit of crowding, I should have, it would actually be more minimally invasive to the patient to have only done veneers because I put them through two procedures, mm-hmm. I could have put them through one. I'm not talking about cases where you've got massive crowding, like where you've got to cut into dentine. I'm just talking about ones where you've got mild crowding and you're so focused on doing ortho for every case that you do ortho unnecessarily for a case that probably should just be a veneer case. But that, you know, the, what's really important with treatment planning is make a decision, take responsibility for it, and then move on. Okay, you... you if you agonize for 17 days over a treatment plan, it's probably not going to get any better. And people will still be able to question it and argue about it and say it was wrong, no matter how you do it. So you make a decision, you make it quickly, talk to the patient. If you can't make a decision, ask the patient more questions. Make your decision, live with it, move on. Beautifully said. And that leads us a link to the, the final of uh, uh, Lincoln's lessons. And this is about something that, I struggled with a lot in the early years before I came to RATP and you know what, I, I haven't mastered it and I'm going to get better at it and I, I, I know I will. Uh, but it's about how uncomfortable uh, dentists can get and particularly, you know, I, I do believe that the less experienced you are uh, and also depends on your, on your mindset, on your uh, limited beliefs that you have on money. Okay, so um, I I would uh, find it difficult early years to charge above a certain point because that point was where I start getting uncomfortable and you helped me massively to overcome that barrier and to, to, so if you could just give a flavor of that element of RATP in terms of why are we so uncomfortable with discussing fees at various stages of our career and how we can overcome that. We're uncomfortable discussing fees because we are one of the only types of healthcare uh, if you're in private practice, yep. that is almost completely unsubsidized for anything extensive. So, like if you have a, if cardiologist had to just sit there and tell the patient how much it was going to cost for, you know, to have a stent put in your heart in full, you know, paying full freight, they would be uncomfortable too. But particularly if they had to do that when they were 22 and they weren't fully trained. 
you know, they were still a registrar, their first year of cardiology training. You had to sit there and look at the patient and guy and go, you know, it's going to be 27,000 pounds for this. Is that okay? <laughs> okay. They would be uncomfortable too, but they don't get to do that. And by the time they do have to do that, they're usually, you know, 45, they're well off and they have a office receptionist who does it for them. So, uh, <laughs> That's part of it. Part of it is that we are in a surgical specialty that pays patients have to pay full freight. So that's part of it. And we have to start doing that early in our career when f we don't have experience, we don't have a lot of confidence, and we don't have a lot of money. It's very hard to talk about something that costs more than we personally can afford. The other part of it is that we get beat on in the media all the time. So we just generally have this self-consciousness about cost of dentistry because we're always getting hammered for it. And it's not our fault, okay? It, it's not our fault that dentistry is expensive. Everything's expensive. It's just most things are subsidized by the government. So there's a few reasons why. Uh, and also, we're not very good at communicating costs in our early days. So we do get a lot of rejection and it takes mm -hmm. time to get over that rejection. And particularly if you start trying to present big treatment plans in your first visit, you'll get a lot of rejection. I, I still would if I did that. So, uh, but I call it the emotional price. Everyone has a price where when their treatment plan goes above that price, they get uncomfortable. So, you know, every person will be different. Like for some people, it's going to be, uh, you know, 2,000 pounds, $2,000. Well, when mostly when you're a graduate, it's really low. It's like $1,000. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's because well, as a graduate, I, I, I could I could tell you when when I, when I was first year out of dental school because of the um, national health system uh, that I was working under at that point, um, where the maximum barrier of uh, the health fund the treatment was something like two hundred fifty pounds, right? So that was the ceiling of anything that you could do that was within the NHS. So then, if they wanted a, a fancy uh, aesthetic option that was perhaps not in there, then as soon as it got to about three hundred pounds, I was like, whoa, I'm going way above that other barrier. So uh, th that was a limiting belief that I had, and and and, and yeah. Yeah, that was uh, very difficult to overcome at that stage in my in my career. Yeah, and it is. There's several things that overcome it. One is realizing that it's there. That's the first thing. So it's like any type of psychological boogeyman. Once you can give it a name and look it in the eye, it's less scary. So, you know, everyone has an emotional price. That's the price where your treatment plan goes from being uncomfortable to comfortable. And I have one. Uh, it, it's just got bigger over time. So when I first graduated, it was a thousand dollars. I remember the first time I did an eleven thousand dollar treatment plan. I actually was so afraid. I had to practice saying it so that I wouldn't just like choke. I would sit there going, okay, and this treatment will cost it. You know, <laughs> choke. <laughs> cost. <laughs> I can't say it. The words won't come out. Okay. Uh, so I mean, we train people in RETP and that, and, that, and you can watch that happening online. But the, the uh, uh, practice helps. So practicing something uncomfortable. You don't avoid discomfort. You just confront it. Uh, so if you're doing a treatment plan that's more expensive than you've ever done before, uh, practice saying it so that you can say it, you know, deadpan. Like it shouldn't be like, ha, 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 ha. It should be like the weather, you know, today it's cloudy and raining. Uh, today the treatment plan that you need to meet your goals is going to be 15000 Is that going to work for you? Okay, And it's okay to say it's expensive. Don't like I go to all these courses and they come up with this, like as if you can just change the, the words that you use and, you know, yeah, like, oh, it's going to be an investment in your health. Okay, that, that, that's nonsense. Like, first of all, investments grow in value, okay? Your teeth depreciate. You can't, like, do your set of ideas and then sell them on eBay for more in five years' time. That's not true, okay? So, uh, you know, they amortize really, you know, it's like 100% write-off in the first year. So, uh, you and it's okay to say it's expensive. It is expensive. You know, your dentistry, they go, look, how much will it be? Uh, look, it's going to be expensive. And, and in the first visit, part of my process now for softening people up to the price so that they don't get a big shock when we finally get to it is to give them a range right up front. So the very first visit, you always give the patient a range on their overall treatment plan, but it has to be massive. Like, it's common. Like I gave a patient yesterday a treatment plan range because we won't plan her treatment. It was a new patient. I won't tra plan her treatment for about three months. Do exactly what I say, okay? And uh, the range I gave her was a minimum of 12,000 and a maximum of 100. Now, that's much less threatening 
And then I say, look, it's like a house renovation. How much does a kitchen cost? It depends. It depends if you get, you know, if you get Gaganau appliances and, you know, fancy marble bench tops, it's going to cost more than if you have LG and Lemon X. So uh, <clears throat> teeth are the same. Uh, if you do a 100 square meter kitchen with a butler's pantry, it's going to cost more than a tiny little one. So the... Patients can understand that. So, you know, you, I give them a big range in that way that they don't get a shock. But as far as your emotional price goes, you need to practice. It's harder when you need money. So, like, try not to be financially stretched too much. Like, if you have, you know, if you start a practice and then you immediately buy a big house and two fancy cars, uh, and the student loan. It will be more difficult to talk about the price of expensive dentistry than if you don't, okay? Because you, it's always harder when you need it. Uh, uh, as your wealth increases, it gets easier because, you know, as your assets go up and it doesn't seem such a large amount to you anymore. So, uh, No one ever spoke about that before, until I came to RTP. No one ever spoke about that, you know, maybe it's because you're a dentist and some of these uh, uh, people in sales are, are not dentists, but yeah, it was the first time I heard it um, in that way about that discomfort and why we get it and it's to do with our own wealth as well. And I never heard it and it just made so much sense to me. Yeah, a lot of it's actually like psychologically, it's like a projection, you know, where we're, we're putting ourselves in the patient's shoes and then we're going, okay, if I was them, could I, would that be comfortable for me? Okay. And, but then there's also other things like rejection. We're afraid of being rejected. Uh, and we're afraid of the patient saying that we're a rip off to the neighbor and, you know, getting put in the media, like dentists ripping everyone off again and so on. So there's a whole bunch of things. And we all have different philosophies too. You know, like some people just have a philosophy that dentistry should be the bare minimum possible. And other people have a philosophy that, you know, we're basically real estate developers of the mouth. And that, that, both of those are fine and a good example of that is that I love the fact that Yosemite National Park is very underdeveloped. Like for a big American park, there's, there's not a lot of development in there. But I also like, you know, um, some of the Italian coastline that's been heavily populated for, you know, thousands of years and it's also beautiful. So both, you know, untouched and touched by man can be, beautiful in their own way. So I think that, uh, uh, you know, there'll be philosophical differences to come into it as well. But definitely everyone has a price that they find it difficult to treat and plan over and their treatment plans will tend to stay just under that. And it's good to recognize what your price is. So, you know, just ask yourself, am I comfortable with a $1,000 or £1,000 treatment plan or 2000 or 5000 or 10000 or 20000 At what point are you starting to feel a little bit tight in the tummy? And for me, it started at 1,000, then it went up to like about just over 10 for quite a long time. And then I started doing rehabs, it jumped up to 50 Australian, so, and then it stuck there for years and years and years and years. And then, then it got stuck at like 80, and I don't know what it is now, it's probably, you know, it's probably 55 or 60,000 pounds uh, is my emotional price now, uh, but I don't really know. Um, and also you kind of get, you just get used to it. Like, and I, I, Comes not, experience. All my treatment are expensive. Like yesterday I saw a patient who needs a filling and a scale and that's fine. I'm not too posh. So, <laughs> yeah. I like doing fillings. They're kind of easy. <laughs> well, there we have it, uh, ladies and gents. Uh, Lincoln Harris still does a, a disto occlusal and a lower premolar. Um, <laughs> uh, and look, yeah, I, I'm, I'm only jesting there. I mean, your, your work is is, is inspirational. Uh, you're someone I, 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 I look up to a lot, and I will, you know, look, continue to to follow your your teachings. Um, and especially with Right Global, can you just tell us uh, just before we finish, what have you got planned? What's the future of, of, of Right Global uh, so, the next well. couple? Uh, so we've just been right global we, we are expanding massively with our online education but we want to make it so much better so we uh we actually now employ did you watch the movie extraction not not yet no. it's about chris hemsworth yeah, yeah, yeah. i saw okay. bits of it yeah i saw bits of it, it looks it looks yeah. really cool yeah so we uh we our cinematographer is the same guy now so ah. we uh 
Yeah, so that's how we push the boundary. So that is uh, cool. Look, Ripe Global is is so simple. We want to make education better, more widely available, lower cost. And and how do you do that? You just take it closer. So, you know, stage one is significantly increasing our online content and making it better and making better production values and and really stepping up the quality of the online, which is to be fair, quite tricky during coronavirus because our we have a director, so our content director is actually a movie TV director, and uh, uh, we can't travel, so it's a little bit tricky at the moment. But the that that's step one, and step two is uh, teaching facilities in multiple continents so that they're closer to the audience, uh, and, and particularly the high quality ones that I like to use in like the ones we have in Sydney. They're not available in everywhere in the world, so. Uh, and, and the way we teach hands-on is very, it's driven by aviation. When you, you can't learn to do dentistry just theoretically. It has to be repetition. You can't like do one crown prep and then you're good to go. You need to sit there and you need to do like, well, normally in the first, our first hands-on module, we do um, 20 crown preps in a day and a half. And that's not because we want to teach people to be fast. It's just that to train the hand, you have to do things again and again and again and again. Okay, like none of us would fly with a pilot who had read everything about flying but had only <laughs> landed a couple of times. Experience counts. So <clears throat> to, to really ramp up the quality of teaching so people get uh, – and, and with the online, it makes it so much easier. You can put all of the theory online. People can have it on done. And when they come to the hands-on, they just do hands-on. They're not sitting there spending – Two thirds of the hands on listening to a lecture and watching a demonstration. So that can all be online first. So that Genius. your time is much better value. So that's the third, <clears throat> second step. And the third step is to become accredited as an education provider. So, uh, and, you know, to do that, uh, <clears throat> people say, well, why, you know, we've built the company so that we can list it on the stock market in a few years. And you go, well, why? Because I don't want to sell out. I don't want to have to sell the whole company to, a venture capital one day so people who in you know there's a ton of people investing in it right now and to uh uh from all over the world there's like 20 different countries people who have invested in ripe global and uh the actually quite fun one of my patients also invested and he owns a software <laughs> factory so he's like causing oh, the carries brilliant. and helping fix it <laughs> it's, it's vertically integrated <laughs> um, so uh uh anyways that's right global Make it better, make it more widely available, make it less expensive. Well, I think I think it's a, it's, a, it's a great vision. I, I, I look forward to when you set up in, in Europe. I think uh, I, I don't know if you're allowed to reveal where. I think Prague was it. Is oh, that- look, Prague. Prague was definitely our first uh, thing, but we obviously have to wait till we can travel again, and then sure, we will go and look at it more closely when we're ready. So, uh, uh, and then probably. I'm thinking the first places we're likely to go is, you know, Prague and then probably South Asia and then potentially Middle East, but we'll see. Uh, well, that sounds you know, amazing. It, I'll put all the links and stuff for those that are watching, listening, uh, you know, in, in, in the usual places on the website and whatnot. Uh, but um, definitely worth checking out. And uh, I recently contributed uh, to, to Right Global. That's due to go up soon. Uh, and I'd like to get involved even more. So uh, it's, 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 a, it's a great thing where you're welcoming contributions from all over the world uh, who can add Absolutely. to this uh, um, community of expertise you have. It's, it's a fantastic concept. Yeah, and I think that, you know, where we... Uh, you know, we want we want everything. You know, so we've got endo stuff coming soon. Uh, there's a lot of restorative stuff. So there, obviously, there's a lot of my restorative stuff. There's a lot of occlusion stuff from Michael Melkers. Uh, there's soft tissue grafting. There's bone grafting stuff. And there's a whole bunch of endo lectures coming soon. Uh, <clears throat> you know, we want to have everything, and we don't just want to have like little webinary things. So they're appropriate at sometimes. We actually want full on, you know, a two day lecture on one topic. You can watch all twelve modules and get CPD because we are accredited for the for the GDC. So the uh, uh, <clears throat> And for the US and New Zealand and wherever else as well. So, but the, uh, you know, we are really pushing to how can we do this better? And and as soon as we can travel, you know, the, the TV production team and the cinematographer will be off to all of our teachers. And and I mean, you can already start to see the the, the effect on the quality of the content that's coming out now from having a director who yeah, works yeah. for us full time. You know, it. 
it's I said to him I want I want education to become cinematic and he's delivering so it's uh, I'm, uh, I'm salivating honestly I'm salivating and I'm, I'm, I'm really excited for, for the future you've got great you know UK guys like Tom Seeley on board as well and I'm a massive fan of his he's a good friend yeah. so uh, look um, Link thank you so much for coming on the podcast I, I really appreciate it honestly to me you you really are someone a massive role model and, and to give your time up to come on the, on the show uh, after you've taught me so much over the years and I'm, I'm actually looking forward to learn even more from you uh, thank you so much no, no worries at all. And and you're welcome to learn more because the way I've learned most stuff is by painful mistakes. And so I'm sure you'll do that along the way as well because you can't progress unless you do. So Absolutely. Well uh, said. Well and said. Thank, thank you for having me. It's been a pleasure uh, and uh, great to catch up with you again. You too, Link. Thank you. Producer Auntie, thank you so much for listening all the way to the end. I always pre- appreciate it. You know that I always really appreciate you uh, coming all the way to the end to hear my little outro. So obviously, I'm hoping you gained a lot of value from that. And I'm hoping I picked good lessons. I mean, I know loads of you out there are Lincoln Harris fans or you're already part of Ripe Global. So I'm sure you have your own five or six lessons uh, that uh, Lincoln has taught you. And I'm sure, I mean, a lot of these I covered were non-clinical. You can't even believe the number of clinical gems that I've learned from Lincoln Harris. So Lincoln, again, thanks so much for all you do for our profession. And once again, if you'd go on the show notes on protrusive.co.uk or on the Protrusive Dental Community Facebook group, you could find those coupon codes I, I shared with you so you can get uh, uh, your discount before 31st of January 2021 for Ripe Global. So thank you so much, Ripe Global, for offering that to all our members. Uh, and I will catch you in the next episode in 2021. Thank you. <laughs> <laughs>